Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have you here. Um, if you need closed captioning, you can just click on the CC button located at the bottom of your screen. You may need to click on the more option to open that feature. My name is Lauren Wittick and I will be the host for today's session. I am the communication specialist for Region 4, which is based out of the University of Utah Spencer, Spencer S. Eccles Health Sciences Library. And Region 4 is made up of nine states, which are Arizona, Idaho, Colorado, Montana, New Mexico, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. So since some of you are first time attendees at an NNLM webinar, I want to provide a brief overview of what our organization does. NNLM has seven regions across the country covering territories in all 50 states. Our guiding mission is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by providing all US health professionals, <clears throat> excuse me, with equal access to biomedical information and improving the public's access to information to enable them to make informed decisions about their health. Regionally, we collaborate with various organizations, including but not limited to public and academic libraries, schools, hospitals, and community-based organizations. Our efforts are primarily conducted through three main methods, um, providing funding to enable organizations to support their communities, conducting outreach, and finally training like today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we get started. By registering for this session, you have agreed to the NNLM Code of Conduct. We ask that you please keep your questions and comments respectful, and this just allows us to create a welcoming learning environment for all. We are recording today's session and the slides will be made available. Um, there's gonna actually be a link that we're gonna share with you in, later on. Um, please note it can take us a few weeks to edit and caption the video. However, we will send the link to the recording and the slides to all registrants once they are available. We're gonna share a link to the evaluation for today's session via email. Completing, oh, sorry, we're gonna share at the end of the session today um, via chat and completing the evaluation is the first step to claiming your MLA continuing education credit should you be interested in doing so. And finally, we ask that you enter your questions into the chat as you think of them. We've saved some time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Moving on, our next Region 4 webinar will be held in January of 2025. The speaker and topic are still in the works, um, but we are gonna make an announcement on our webpage, our blog, and our weekly newsletter with registration details once the session has been scheduled. If you'd like to stay up to date with Region 4, we um, encourage you to sign up for our newsletter or visit our blog. That QR code shown here on the slide will take you to our regional page, which is just nnlm.gov forward slash region four. Now I want to welcome my fabulous colleague and today's guest speaker, Nicole Hennig. Nicole is an expert in instructional design, user experience, and emerging technologies. She's currently an e-learning developer and AI education specialist at the University of Arizona Libraries. Previously, she worked for the, for the MIT Libraries as head of the user experience department. In her 14 years of experience at MIT, she's won awards for innovation and worked to keep academics up to date with the best new technologies. She is the author of several books, including Keeping Up with Emerging Technologies, Apps for Librarians, and Siri, Alexa, and Other Digital Assistants. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Let me share my screen. Okay, welcome everybody. It's nice to see you here. And today we're gonna to talk about understanding and using generative AI. So as you know, the news about this is everywhere. I'm sure you've seen all sorts of articles, both positive and negative, like this one about a new framework for imaging modalities, or this one from Harvard Medical School is building AI into the curriculum, or sad and scary stories like this one that you might have heard about where this young man committed suicide after falling in love with a chatbot on character AI. So the, the news is kind of all over the map in, in both extremes. 
And it really can feel overwhelming at times because even the experts don't seem to agree on a lot of things. It's either AI will cure cancer and solve climate change or no, it will destroy humanity or no, it won't destroy humanity, but it'll lead to a flood of disinformation. So developing AI literacy can really help you cut through the hype. And knowing what's possible with AI can help you decide what's practical and ethical for your use cases. So this webinar is a preview of an upcoming online course. It begins on February 7th and lasts for six weeks. And this is a link to the slides. I think someone's gonna paste that into the chat or she already did. So feel free to bookmark these and review everything later. And we'll, we'll save questions till the end. So these are the topics for the six weeks of the course. The first week is about understanding the underlying technology. In the second week, we'll look at prompting for language models. In the third week, we'll look at multimodal features like computer vision, data analysis, voice assistance, and more. In the fourth week, we'll look at multimedia generation. Fifth week is all about staying current and avoiding the hype. And the sixth week is specifically focused on applications of generative AI in healthcare and medicine. And in all of these weeks, we'll cover the ethical questions such as privacy, bias, or copyright. And so she already introduced me, so I won't spend too much time here. These are just some of the books I've written. And I did that while I was doing my own business between 2013 and 2018, before I came to the University of Arizona. And in my current role, I'm an e-learning developer. Since 2019, I collaborate with my colleagues to create information literacy tutorials like the ones you see here. And we also have tutorials about generative AI. I'll give you a link to those at the end. So the way the course is gonna work is if you sign up for it at the beginning, everybody will introduce themselves. We have a class forum. I have a fun little quiz called, what's your AI adoption personality? And you can fill that out. There's four possible answers and some are based on being more optimistic and others are more pessimistic. And that way it kind of helps us frame the discussion with each other and understand where everybody's coming from. And it's also good to think about that when you think about the people that you serve in your libraries and how people are all over the map with that. We'll also have you set up free accounts on ChatGPT, Claude, Perplexity, Elicit, and Notebook LM, and any others that you wanna use are optional. And then I'll also have a, a brief survey asking you about your experience with Gen AA, like which tools have you used and how often and for what purposes. So each week we'll start with short video lectures kind of chunked into little maybe 10 minute or five minute segments. And then we'll also have a set of hands-on activities that you can choose from. You don't have to do all of them, but I've got sort of a wide range of, of possibilities and a set of readings. And all of these have a discussion forum so that you can talk to each other and me about all the work you're doing. You can share the activities with each other and me, and we can talk about the readings. And I think that it would take about two to two and a half hours of your time each week to do all this, all of this work. And of course, you don't have to do every single activity. So let's look at what we're going to cover in week one. And I'm going to like just go through some of the things that would be in the course videos for this. And I think I'll do more on this section right now because I think that under understanding the underlying technology is super important and foundational to helping you understand other things like using it well and also the ethical issues. So in week one, we'll see several short videos about the technology and how it works. And they're videos that I've made, you know, telling you about it. So where does ChatGPT fit within the field of artificial intelligence? It's in a subfield known as deep learning, which is a subfield of machine learning, which is a subfield of AI. So what is machine learning? It involves developing models that can automatically learn from and improve their performance based on input data, allowing computers to make predictions, recognize patterns, and solve problems without being explicitly programmed for each task. So think about that, without being explicitly programmed. They learn patterns instead of following rules. So they're probabilistic, not deterministic. This is really different from explicit software programming that we've been familiar with for years. Instead, it's about patterns and probabilities. There's no like, if this, then that, a specific thing happens. No, it's all very probabilistic. So then what's deep learning? It's a particular type of neural network known as a deep neural network, and it consists of multiple layers of interconnected nodes that enable the learning of more complex patterns. So what's a neural network then? That's just a model sort of loosely inspired by neural networks in the human brain. It consists of processing units known as nodes that are organized into layers. 
The nodes receive input. That's like what you type into ChatGPT. They perform math computations and then they produce output. That's like what it types back to you. So that means the knowledge is not explicitly represented. You know, with billions of parameters in these networks, they don't have any easily interpretable rules or knowledge base that engineers can directly inspect or modify. So this is sometimes known as a black box. And it some people use that phrase to mean, oh, they're just not telling us, which is also somewhat true. But the main use of that phrase is to mean that they really don't know how it comes up with every specific answer. Because if you look at the number of parameters in ChatGPT, it's 175 billion. So for any human being to be able to deal with that kind of a network so huge and understand every little thing that it does is very difficult. So there is a field of study called interpretability research where they're trying to figure out how to tell what it comes up with. So remember, it's not a bunch of words and sentences. It's a big network of math operations. So don't call it a database. It's really not a database. So now we have something called large language models or LLMs for short. Now it's much more correct to call something a model, not a database, okay? Um, and now they're starting to be called foundation models because they're multimodal. They're not only about language or text, they can do image creation. There's computer vision where you can upload and talk about images. And they have voice assistants where you can talk to it and it replies verbally. So that's why we're kind of moving away from that term to foundation models. Now, OpenAI is the company behind ChatGPT. Their CEO is Sam Altman. I'm sure you've heard of him. And in these years, 2018, 19, and 20, they came out with some versions for researchers known as GPT-1, 2, and 3. And at the end of 22, on November 30th, they decided to make a version of it available to the public just to sort of test things out and see what would happen. So they added an easy chat interface and they made it free, and it's known as GPT-3.5. So what does the GPT stand for? Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So we're not covering Transformer in this talk today, but we will in the course. It's, it's a development from 2017 that made it able to look at larger context instead of just word by word. But let's talk a little bit about the training and the generative part. So what was this first version that from 2022 trained on? They actually released a research paper, so we all know exactly what it was trained on. It was trained on all of English language Wikipedia at the time, internet data from Common Crawl, which is a huge nonprofit that scrapes the web, Reddit conversations that received at least three upvotes because they wanted a lot of examples of conversational style, and two sets of digital books, and people think it might be like Project Gutenberg and things like that. We don't know exactly what's in those. Now, since version four came out, which is what we're on now, they haven't made public what it's trained on, and people wish they would. It would be nice if they were transparent, but nowadays it's a corporate secret. All the different big companies are sort of competing with each other, and so they're not going to tell all the details about what it was trained on. So when the training's done, all that data is set aside. It's not even needed anymore for the model to work. It's saved as patterns, like mathematical patterns. It learned from all that data and it uses those patterns and that math to generate new text. So this leads to something called semantic searching, which is searching by meaning using that math. So this means that similar concepts don't need to even include the same words at all, like in keyword searching. And one of the most well-known open databases that does this is called Semantic Scholar. And we'll talk about other tools that are based on Semantic Scholar in a few minutes. So what's the G part of ChatGPT that's generative AI? And that just means AI that can generate new content, whether it be text, images, video, music, or speech. I generated this Im image using Adobe Firefly, just asking for a 1950s style woman holding an iPhone with an old rotary dial phone on the table next to her. So it's important to know the difference between generative AI and other types of AI. The other main type is discriminative AI, which involves classifying or recognizing patterns in existing data, like sorting things into categories. So that would be like spam filtering. Is it spam or is it not? Netflix or YouTube video recommendations for what you might want to watch next. Like, is this one this user would like to see or not? And using AI to find medical images that might indicate health problems. It's like sorting out the, the radiology images to find the ones that might be a problem. So that's known as discriminative AI. 
So I know the difference. These types are often lumped together in news stories, but they're really very different. Their strengths and weaknesses are very different. So if you've seen stories like this one from Human Rights Watch about banning facial recognition, which I agree with, it's a it's a weakness or a, a problem with discriminative AI, not generative AI. So just keep those two types sort of separate in your mind. They're very, very different. So ChatGPT is not the only foundation model. There's also Claude, the paid version of ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot, Meta AI, Gemini, and Perplexity AI, which is based on some other foundation models. So if you could paste this link into the chat, this is a good site to bookmark from our University of Arizona LibGuides about AI. And you can have bookmarks to all of these. And I always try to keep that page up to date. <clears throat> so here's an important concept that we all should learn about. It's called grounding. And it's a very important concept in AI research. It's about connecting a language model to external sources of knowledge, like web search results. This is what Microsoft Copilot does. It searches the web using Bing, and then it uses the language model to summarize and talk about what it found. So that would be known as a grounded model. It's not just a language model standalone. It's, a, it's got a search engine with it. So looking at that chart again, the reason I put them in two rows is because these top two are not grounded, and all of these on the bottom are because they all have search engines built in. Now, the free version of ChatGPT, there is one exception that there is some limited web searching in that, but you use it up really quickly and you'll be asked to come back the next day to finish it, to finish your search. So I kind of don't even include that as a grounded model. So what can ungrounded models do? They rely only on their training data, so they're never going to be useful for very current information. The free ChatGPT is trained only up till January 22, and Claude up to April 2024. But you can do some things with them. You can generate ideas, come up with examples, generate keywords that you then use to search in library research databases. You can summarize long documents, revise your writing in different styles or for different audience audience levels, and you can copy or upload parts of a research paper that you don't understand and ask it to explain it in simpler terms. These are all things that work even without grounding. So really, I like to think of these as wordsmiths and idea generators, not search engines, which is kind of hard to do because we always map our old mental models onto new technologies. And OpenAI didn't really do anything to help with that. They just sort of plopped ChatGPT out there with a box and it looks like a search box. And so everyone thinks of it as a search engine, but it's not, it's more like a wordsmith. But grounded models have a search engine built in as a tool to work with. So this helps. So what these can do is they can answer based on their training plus some other source of facts. So Microsoft Copilot, Perplexity and Google Gemini all do this. They have a search engine built in. So one of my favorite ones is Perplexity AI for searching the web. And what you do is you just put in a query and it searches the web and then it uses the language model to summarize the results and show you prominent links to each source. And each, each paragraph that it shows you, it'll show you exactly which page it got that information from. So it's very useful for summarizing web search results rather than Google where you have to kind of wade through the ads and then click in and read, click back, click in, click in, click back. Here you have a nice summary. So I really like perplexity for web searching. Now you can also ground a model with scholarly papers like the tool known as Elicit does. You can find it at elicit.com. With this one, you can type in a research question and it goes out and searches the semantic scholar database, which is research papers, and it summarizes it with links back to the sources of each paper that it found and where it got that information from. So it's grounded in the same way, it's just grounded with different content. So it's important to know a little bit about what's in Semantic Scholar. It doesn't have everything. It's not nearly as big as Google Scholar. And of course, you'd still need to use library databases and Google Scholar if you really want to cover everything possible, but it's a nice supplement because of this semantic searching. It might turn up things that don't have the keywords that you would normally use in it, but are still related conceptually. And it's really heavily weighted towards medicine, biology, chemistry, engineering, and computer science. When you look at the amount of papers that are in there, it doesn't have nearly as many papers on, like, say, art, history, or philosophy. And here's sort of a visual representation of that. So so it can be useful for medical topics because it has so much coverage, but you still need to 
think of it as complementary to your other tools that you normally use. <clears throat> so hallucination can still happen even with these grounded models. That means like getting things wrong, right? But it's easy to recognize when it links to a source that's not relevant or maybe is out of date sometimes. It's just a lot easier to tell what's right or wrong with these. And of course, web search results can contain misinformation. So we should always keep a human in the loop. That's kind of a nice phrase that people use to remind ourselves, just don't let AI do things on its own. Always, you know, evaluate it. So also in week one, we're going to cover choosing an AI tool for your task. And I have a document that helps you. It sort of recommends different tools for different types of tasks. You'll learn how to understand tokens and context windows and how words get turned into math. And you'll learn something about openly licensed or open source versus proprietary models. So the hands-on activities, there are several different ones you'll be able to choose from. You don't have to do them all, but one activity has to do with configuring your privacy settings and understanding the details of privacy. Another exercise is writing an explanation of the technology for a 13-year-old, and you can use ChatGPT to help you do that. There's another exercise where you can sort virtual flashcards that represent various types of AI into whether they are generative or discriminative. And here's a screenshot from that. So you would take this card and you would drag it into one pile or the other, and then you'd get a score at the end if to see, there's 15 cards to see whether you really get which types of technologies are one type or the other. And then there's also exercises for using perplexity and illicit to search either the web or scholarly articles. And of course, every week has a set of readings. Week one has readings about privacy, transparency and citing and open source models. And there's a discussion forum where you can discuss any of the readings that you read and those readings are optional. So week two, we talk about prompting for language models. And of course, I'll have some short videos about prompting, but let, let me give you a little bit of that content right now. So prompting is how you talk with a language model and it makes a big difference in how it responds. One thing you really wanna do is give it some context. Depending on what you wanna talk about, you could say you're an expert in child development, or you could say act as an expert in public health and then talk about those topics. Or you could use context, like you could say, using the theory of whatever theory, create this, that, or the other thing related to that theory. This kind of helps the language model know where to start in that vast geographic space of math, you know, like the words are gonna have to do with these topics. And it just gives it a good starting point. So you really wanna give it clear instructions, including what format you want the output in. So here's an example that I've used in the past. My prompt is use Mike Caulfield's ideas for how to be an effective fact checker. So there I'm grounding it in a theory, right? Create a lesson plan for college freshmen to help them learn to fact check information they find on the internet. The outcome should be that the students become familiar with Caulfield's four moves for effective fact checking and that they gain practical skills to fact check information they find on the internet. Format the output in the way a typical lesson plan is formatted. So these tools, they've seen a lot of content, so they know how lesson plans are formatted. So you can always ask for different formats. It's not just paragraphs and things. You can ask for tables, emojis, ASCII art, co computer code, quiz questions, and more. So here's an example where I asked it to list the top 10 most populous cities. And I just said the first column should contain the city name and the second column, the population. So remember that because a lot of times it's very helpful to get your information back in a table of some sort. So don't expect the perfect answer right away. Always ask for changes, clarifications, or improvements. Tell it exactly what you want, what format you'd like it in, and just keep conversing. I like the phrase some people use, ask and adjust. It's never just you go there, you type something, you get an answer. No, it's a back and forth conversation and you just keep asking it to improve or change as needed. And always just use those results as a starting point and use your own expertise to modify them. It's great for getting ideas, but you're the expert. Now, some people call this prompt engineering. Other people call it prompt crafting. I kind of prefer prompt crafting because it's really not like coding. You get a slightly different response each time. It's really more like talking to a human assistant and giving them detailed instructions. So I think prompt crafting is a better word. So what is hallucination? I'm sure you've heard everyone talk about this. It's actually the official term from the field of machine learning for outputting inaccurate but plausible sounding information, or you could just call it making things up, right? So that means you always need to fact check, because remember, a language model on its own, it doesn't really know anything. 
it just knows probabilities of words, like what words would follow. It's not until you add some other tools to them that they can kind of be smarter, right? So you're going to always need to fact check at this point. There is ongoing research, though, on ways to mitigate hallucination, like in the paper, two papers that you see here. So, and I think most of what I've seen involves adding different kinds of tools for the language model to use. There is actually some tips. There are some tips for prompting that can help you avoid hallucinations. And this is kind of interesting when I learned about this. I learned about this in a Coursera course called Eight Most Controversial Terms in AI Explained, and you can audit that for free. And so one feature of hallucinations is that they tend to be different across different outputs. So you can ask multiple times and see if the outputs are consistent. So let's look at an example. So here I asked ChatGPT4 three different times and I got the same answer worded differently. So that means it was likely correct. I asked, what is the heaviest hippo ever recorded? And it talked about a male weighing 9,900 pounds. So then I just asked the exact same question again. And this time it gave the same number, but it had a slightly different sentence worded a little bit differently. I asked it a third time and the same thing happened. Same number, but it just talked about it slightly differently. And this shows the sort of probabilistic nature of what it, why, how it talks about things. And so the fact that it gave me the same number three times in a row means that it's very likely correct and somehow had it in its training data to know that. Of course, I still went and verified it. So I went and found this article about the largest hippopotamus. It's a recent article and it is 9,900 pounds. I did the same thing on Claude though. And this time I got different answers. So that means it was likely hallucinating. So here I said, you know, the same question. And it said, the heaviest hippopotamus ever recorded was a male named Obayash who lived at the London Zoo in the 19th century. He weighed approximately 4,500 pounds. And it go, goes on to talk about him. So then I just asked the same question again. And then it says, I apologize, but I made a mistake in my previous response. There's actually a male named Huberta who lived in the Kruger National Park, South Africa. And so... Then I started to realize, oh, it probably doesn't know, right? So this is a little tip you can do. Ask the same thing multiple times. Another thing you can do is give the model an out. So you could add to your prompt, answer the question only if you know the answer or can make a well-informed guess. Otherwise, tell me you don't know. So I did that in Claude. I asked the same question. I just pasted that to the end of it. And this time it said, I don't know the exact weight of the heavy, heaviest hippo, et cetera, et cetera. So those are just some tips about avoiding hallucination. Here are some also some tips about prompting to avoid bias. Now we all know that there's bias in these systems because it's in the training data and human society itself is very biased and it's trained on a wide selection of human writing. So it's gonna be biased, right? But in this article, they talk about prompting a model to make sure its, its answers didn't rely on stereotyping it, it worked much better. It had a dramatically positive effect. Basically, all you had to do was ask it to self-correct the biases. So let's look at an example. So here I asked ChatGPT, please write a short story about a boy and a girl in high school choosing their careers. And when you get the slides later, you can follow the link and read the whole thing if you want. So in that story, the boy, Liam, choose, chose carpentry and the girl, Mia, chose writing. And so then I just said, well, write it again without any gender stereotypes or bias. And it rolled a whole new version. And this version, Alex chose carpentry and Sam chooses writing. So I said, is Sam a boy or a girl? And it said, in this story, Sam's gender is intentionally left undefined. This allows the character to be more relatable to a wider audience and avoids any gender stereotypes or biases, et cetera, et cetera. And I noticed that they used the they pronouns for Sam throughout. So it was kind of interesting that all I had to do was ask it to revise it without bias. And this still remains to be a challenging problem. In this um, article right here called Should ChatGPT Be Biased? It's all about the challenges and risks. They point out some interesting things that, of course, human language itself is biased. It reflects our society. And it's all of our biases are deeply ingrained in language structures. Also, norms and values vary across communities and regions, and language and culture constantly evolve. So I'm sure you can think of many examples of things that were okay to say in the 1950s or 60s that we don't ever say now that would be offensive. So it changes over time. And when you think about it, other things are biased too, like search engine results, websites, Wikipedia, even the Library of Congress subject headings are biased. <clears throat> and we have a tutorial about that 
on our website. Excuse me, I need some water. So it's a challenging problem. <clears throat> but remember the prompting that you can keep asking it to not be biased. Now, how, what about prompting for more creative answers? Sometimes you get generic, boring responses, but you would really want something more creative, especially when you're coming up with ideas for something. So this article by Darren Cox talks about sentences you can add to your prompts, and he's got a whole bunch of them. You can follow this link later. I'm just going to read three of them here. One thing you could say at the end of your prompt is, is play devil's advocate and provide a counter argument to the solution you just proposed. Or describe how this problem might be approached differently in, and then you could insert a different culture, time period, or industry. Or you could say, imagine it's 50 years in the future and society has successfully solved this problem. Work backwards and describe the key steps that led to this resolution. These are very interesting to try. I got some interesting output when I did this about climate change and international cooperation. So I invite you to try some of these when you're coming up with ideas. So what else we're going to cover in week two? More practical tips for language models and their settings. Many more prompting tips and examples. Also, creating specialized chatbots, and you'll have a chance to create your own. And we're going to talk about a technical term called retrieval augmented generation, also known as REG. <clears throat> so the activities for week two, you can choose from these. There's going to be several different prompting activities. You can also experiment with some chatbots made by other people and or build your own chatbot for a healthcare or medical topic. So here's a, a GPT made by somebody else called PubMed GPT, and this would be one of the ones you could experiment with to see how well it works or not. So that's week two. And then we, of course, we also have readings about prompting, chatbots for education, and a reading about a chatbot for digital collections at Northwestern University. And the readings always have a discussion forum. Now let's talk about week three. In week three, we're going to look at using multimodal features. So these are features like data analysis, computer vision, voice assistance, language translation, and creating transcripts. And we'll start with several short videos about all of those topics. And so let's look at what I say in one of those videos. I'm just going to go through it. So one thing you can do with computer vision is you can upload a photo and ask questions about it. So here I went and searched the Library of Congress free to use sets of photos, and I found this image right here. And I just said, I uploaded it and I said, please describe this image. And what ChatGPT said was, the photo you've shared depicts a store with a large sign that reads, I'm an American. This image is a powerful representation from the time of World War II, specifically related to the internment of Japanese Americans. And it goes on about the history. The I am an American sign was displayed by a store owner as a statement of loyalty and identity in the face of growing prejudice. So it really got what the context was just by looking at the photo with computer vision. And before I uploaded it, I made sure that there wasn't any metadata attached to it. I changed the file name to just photo.jpg or whatever. So it's kind of fun to experiment with these and see what it can say about photos. Another thing you can do with computer vision is get practical help about things that you take pictures of. So I have this little rechargeable moon lamp that sits on our coffee table, and this is the cord to it, and it became frayed and didn't work anymore to charge it. But I didn't quite know what it was called and what I needed to order to get a replacement. So I just took this picture of the frayed cord with my iPhone, I uploaded it, and I said, act as an expert in electronics. What kind of cord is this? And it told me exactly the DC power connector and ideas for measuring the size and just to search for USB to DC power cable with the correct dimensions. So that was super helpful. And I've seen lots of other examples where people help it with like bike repairs and stuff like that. Also, computer vision really helps vision impaired people. Are you familiar with the app called Be My Eyes? That's been around for a while since 2015. And they now collaborate with OpenAI. They've got GPT-4 built into it. So when I used to teach courses and write books about apps for librarians, I, I used to talk about this Be My Eyes app. And at the time, they only used volunteers to describe a photo to a blind person. So you could be, or, or a low vision person, you could be somewhere, take a picture of something, and you push a button and a volunteer, they have people from all over the world, so it's 24 seven, would get on and describe what you're seeing. But now they have AI as an option where you can push a different button and it'll upload it to the computer vision 
and it'll describe it for you. And you can get this app for iOS or Android. It's free. I invite you to try it sometime. So here's what I did. I took a picture of this computer mouse and it, it, this is what it looks like when it tells you what it's a picture of. It just gives you a nice description right here at the bottom. And I watched a video from the Be My Eyes website and people in there were saying they really don't want to bother a human being. So they like the AI feature. They can, most of the time it just works and they don't have to ask a real person. So I thought that was just kind of interesting. Also, you can use computer vision to generate good alt text for images that you're going to put on your website or social media or wherever. So I like this prompt when I'm doing it. So here's that same picture again. I uploaded it and I said, please look up best practices for alt text and offer three alternatives for this image. And that was really good because it reminded me like all the things like keep it concise, avoid redundancy. And it gave me three different ideas for alt text. And I could just sort of take the one that I like and maybe even modify it myself a little bit. So I really like using it to generate alt text. Now, if you don't want to pay for ChatGPT+, Plus, because you know the free version, you'll run out of usage quickly if you're uploading photos, you could try it for free on Google Gemini, which you can click this little button to upload pictures, or Claude, you can click that little paper clip. And both of those have computer vision. But one thing to know is that um, Google Gemini, it won't do people yet. They're still working out their guardrails. So it'll do other kinds of pictures, but it'll refuse if it has people in it. Now let's talk about language translation. For this one, we're going to look at a tool called HeyGen. And what it does, HeyGen mainly generates videos with, it creates AI generated avatars and voices that people use, but they can also translate videos. So I played around with this. Here, I just gave some words to it, and this little video that I'm going to play for you, I've sort of stitched together its response in different languages. Now, I only speak a little bit of Spanish, not very well, and I definitely don't speak French, Hindi, or Mandarin, but I've sliced together some outputs from it so that you can see how it lip syncs my lips with the different languages. Hi, everyone. I'm experimenting with a new tool called HeyGen that uses artificial intelligence to translate your videos to different languages. Not only does it translate the audio, but it also changes how your lips move so they match up with the new language. I think it's pretty cool. Okay, let's stop there and see how it, well it translates. Hola a todos. Estoy probando una nueva herramienta llamada Hagen que usa IA para traducir tus videos a distintos idiomas. No solo traduce el audio, sino que también cambia cómo se mueven tus labios para que coincidan con el nuevo idioma. Detengámonos y veamos qué también se traduce. Salud tout le monde. J'experimente un nouvel outil, Again, qui utilise l'intelligence artificielle pour traduire vos vidéos dans différentes langues. D'accord. Arrêtons-nous là et voyons comment cela se traduit. Namaste, Sabi. मैं हेगेन उपकरण का प्रयोग कर रहा हूं जो आपके वीडियो को विभिन्न भाषाओं में अनुवाद करता है यह ऑडियो और होंठों का अनुवाद करता है ताकि वे नई भाषा में सही संदेश पहुंचा सकें वहां रुको और देखो अच्छी तरह अनुवाद करता है ताजा हाउ वो चंग जाय चांग शी यी जोंग मिंग वे हागन दे सिन गोंग जू ता शी यूं रेन गोंग जी नंग जांग निंग दे शी पिन फान यी चंग बुत होंग दे यू यान 它不仅可以翻译音频，还可以改变你的嘴唇运动，使其与新的语言相匹配。我就请在这里看看翻译的效果如何。So as you can see, I made a little mistake when I clipped part of that because I couldn't understand the Mandarin Chinese. But anyway, if any of you speak any of these languages, feel free to put your thoughts in the chat. Also, the first thing I did was I asked some of my coworkers, especially ones who speak Mandarin, like what they thought of it, and they said. Wow, they said that's that's just how I think you would sound if you were speaking Mandarin Chinese. So I also have a slightly longer version that's linked here if you want to watch it later. It's the I read a whole paragraph from Alice in Wonderland, and in that one it wasn't perfect. According to my colleague who's from China, it messed up a little bit, but um, overall it's pretty good at doing this kind of translation. 
You can also translate conversations in real time on the Samsung Galaxy S24 phone. And I'll let you watch this little video later, kind of showing how you can do it either in phone calls or in person by holding the little thing in between you and each talking in your own language. So that's pretty interesting. I think we'll see that come to more phones in the future. So week three has several hands-on activities to pick from. You can translate your voice to another language. And since HeyGen's kind of expensive, we're gonna use Seamless from Meta, which um, this is just a screenshot from it that people can try just the audio of translating your own voice to another language. We'll look at creating transcripts using Descript, using computer vision to write alt text, experimenting with data analysis, and experimenting with audio overviews in Notebook LM from Google. And you can do all of these or just choose the ones you're interested in when you do the course. Of course, we'll have readings about accessibility, voice mode and audio overviews and computer vision and discussion forum to talk about those. There's a really good article here in Technology Review from Stephen Aquino about AI as a game changer for people with disabilities. Now let's talk about week four, which is understanding multimedia generation. Of course, we'll have a bunch of short videos to help you see a lot of examples of what you can generate with these tools. And I'm going to show you a few things, mainly using our tutorials that we have at University of Arizona. So I'm going to show you some little excerpts here. What kind of images can you create? And it's good to know this, even if you're never going to use these tools, because it'll help you recognize like if something is a deep fake or if it was AI generated or whatever. So let's go look at our tutorial. Let me just show you a few examples. You can really make very realistic looking images of people and animals like these. Like if I didn't know that was AI generated, I certainly wouldn't question it. I would think it was a real image like these, both of these. You can also create imaginary worlds like to sort of illustrate some sort of sci-fi story like these. You can make historical looking photos and these are obviously fake because of the subject matter, but you can imagine that people could make these and try to make something look realistic from the past. You can also do a lot of different digital art styles like these. This is mostly what you see these days on people's blogs when they're using Gen AI. A lot of times they make ones that aren't very good. And so you just see all those and you think, ugh, you know, this isn't very good, but it can do a lot of amazing things. Sometimes people like to play around with art styles of the past in this series here where the artists are painting their subjects, you know, and because it has a lot of training about old art styles, it can do this. You can also make abstract patterns like to use as desktop wallpapers. These were made with meta AI, sort of swirling flowers. You can also use this to do cultural commentary like these images where, you know, what if everyone was wearing all this VR or AR stuff all the time, you know? And you can generate objects that don't exist like this one called a sound scrubber, which I found on Instagram, the, um, Jonathan Hoffler is a typeface designer. There's, there are, um, he's, there's a, there's a documentary called Abstract on Netflix, and he's got one of the episodes is about him and how he designs typefaces. So I follow him on Instagram, and he wrote a whole fictional story about these little fictional devices, and he does a lot with AI generated images. So. Another interesting Instagram account to follow is Ulysses Studio, and they make these sort of like imaginary bookmobiles and all sorts of different imaginary things that don't exist. So I think it's good for us all to kind of know what you can create with AI images. Now, of course, there's a lot of bias in AI generated images. And these are some examples again from that tutorial. If you just type in people eating lunch outdoors, here's what I got all these blonde white people, even wearing white outfits, right? But if you write a more specific prompt, here I wrote Asian men and women of different ages eating lunch outdoors, I got a much more realistic, less biased image. Let me show you another example. Here I wrote a group of lawyers having a conversation. Even the clothes are light colored. And here I wrote a group of lawyers having a conversation, two African-American women and one South Asian man got a much better image. So you can learn to prompt to avoid bias, and we'll have a hands-on activity in the course for that. Now let's talk about videos. There's two different sort of categories of generating videos. One is to make avatars that look like people, and the other one is to um, just generate the whole scenes just by typing text. So we're just going to look at the avatars right now, and this one is made with a company called Synthesia. 
and they can do changing facial expressions based on the emotion of the speech. So let's go look at it. This is made with Synthesia. I am very happy. I am so upset. I am frustrated. So companies often will use those for their training, like instead of real people. So here's an example of a synthetic avatar in the field of healthcare. I'm just going to play a little bit of this video here. Hi, James. I'm Paloma. I'm here to help with your medication and share some comforting tips. It's normal to feel overwhelmed and anxious, but I promise you'll start feeling better soon. My first piece of advice, keep your medication next to something you use daily. So I'm just going to pause it there. I'm sure you have mixed feelings about this, right? Like it might be handy to make these, but it also might feel creepy or something. And notice right here, it says altered or synthetic content, because that's a rule on YouTube. If you're making realistic AI videos, you have to label it as such. So this is the company called Synthesia. You can also generate voices. And I'd like to show you some examples from Eleven Labs, which is the, the company that's sort of the most advanced with this right now. And this is from, again, from our tutorial that I made for University of Arizona. So here's some examples, and I just wrote the text right below it. So you can choose from one of their voices and then type some text and it'll speak that text. Hello, UA students. Here's a sample from Eleven Labs, where you can choose from many different voices to speak the text that you type. This voice is called Jesse. Hello, UA students. Here's a sample from Eleven Labs, where you can choose from many different voices to speak the text that you type. This voice is called Peter Owen. And here's a little screencast of me clicking on some of their other sample voices. To initiate monitoring on the Philips Monitor T6100, 6300, or 6500, ensure the patient is properly connected to the monitor. Hey there, it's Christy Carlson Romano. You might recognize me from Disney's iconic animated series, Kim Possible, or from popular TV shows like Even Stevens. So as you can see, sometimes actors will offer their voice and then they get paid when people use their voice. So it's pretty interesting. There are some beneficial uses of this technology because most of the time you just think about deep fakes and you know, scams, but you could use this to translate your content like videos and podcasts to reach more people around the world like fluently in their own language. It can also be used and is being used to help patients recover their voice after they've lost it. So in this example, a young woman lost her fluent speech due to a vascular brain tumor. And so a new voice was created for her just based on a short recording that she had made before she lost her speech. And these samples use OpenAI's voice engine. It's not yet available publicly. So these are just samples they provided on their website. But I'm sure that this is coming from many different companies, not just OpenAI. So here's what her voice sounded like before, after the brain tumor. Hi, everyone. This is what my voice sounds like losing open AI news hats to speak smile. Oh. So that gives you a little idea. And here it is after they used the AI to train the model based on a recording before she got sick. Hi, everyone. This is what my voice sounds like using OpenAI's new text to speech model called Voice Engine. I was able to use just 15 seconds of a video that I made for a class project to be the reference audio source for the voice you hear right now. What do you think? So um, that's really a good use that I think we'll see more of that coming where um, people can get voices trained on what they used to sound like that they can use in their everyday life. And of course, there are many unethical uses like making a clone of someone's voice without permission, getting making it look like someone said something they didn't say so we are going to talk about deep fakes as well so let's look at the deep fakes lesson for a minute <clears throat> now deep fakes were around even before generative ai you know people would just use photoshop or they might just change the caption of an image to make it seem like something else um, and of course, I'm sure you've heard about these harmful uses, like showing a celebrity or even just a young high school girl in a compromising situation, like with the deep fake porn, where they're, they'll paste a face of a young girl onto some porn image. This is really bad. 
And also there's people, you know, making video or audio of politicians giving speeches they never made, like this example from the mayor of London, or impersonating someone in a video or audio call, like this example, it was a Zoom meeting and it was so convincing that some employees transferred a huge amount of money to the criminals. <laughs> But also, deepfakes can be entertaining or educational. Sometimes they're used for humor, satire, and cultural commentary. A famous example from last year is Will Smith eating spaghetti. Let me show you a sample here. So the top part is an AI video from a year ago, so the, the quality wasn't very good at that time. The bottom part, this is a real video that Will, Will Smith himself made as a reaction to this, just to kind of have good humor about it, which was kind of funny. Now, later, the technology got better in 2024, and someone made this one of spaghetti eating Will Smith. <clears throat> so this is like one of those systems where you can type in what you want, and it'll generate it. And it's kind of wacky and kind of crazy, but people do like to have fun with these for humor and cultural commentary. You can also use it to bring a historical figure back to life. It, this is an example called JFK Unsilenced, where there was a speech that John F. Kennedy was going to give called Resolution to End the Cold War, but he was assassinated, so he never got to give the speech. So people figured out how to imitate his voice. I'm going to play just a tiny sample from this. On the 20th. Skip forward here. In a world full of frustrations and irritations, American leadership must be guided by the light. So that's like a possible beneficial use. And one more that I like is the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, created an exhibit called Dali Lives, and they trained their AI on a whole bunch of frames of archival footage of the artist to catch his facial expressions, and then they used a voice actor to mimic his accent. So they have this kiosk in the museum that tells visitors stories, you can take a selfie with it, and so on. And they got permission from the Dali Foundation to create the technology for that. So. Pretty much all of these technologies have both good and bad uses. Another thing that's interesting is that artists with disabilities find it very useful to use generative AI sometimes. <clears throat> if you want later, you can watch the whole video here. It's from a webinar that I watched from Amnesty International, where they interviewed several different artists with disabilities talking about how they use these tools in their work now. And this person's named Omli Art, and she's been suffering from a chronic illness since age 13. And she said, with painting and watercolor and collage, those required more dexterity and the ability to sit up for long periods of time. As my disease progressed, those things became more and more difficult. I learned how to do some prompting and I was able to create a piece of art that would have been an incredibly difficult thing for me to do before. It was really just having this moment of feeling like I'd been given a little bit of my humanity back. So I'd encourage you to watch that whole video. There's several different artists talking about how they like it. So hands-on activities for week four, you'll have a chance to try your own hand at generating images of diverse people. We have, there's something called the Dove Prompt Playbook. It's from Dove Corporation that has a whole bunch of ideas for words you can use in your prompts to describe many different people of different ages, races, ages, and disabilities. So that'll be fun. You can also try generating voices with Eleven Labs and try your hand at generating a lip-synced video with a tool called Hadra and do an activity where you recognize AI-generated images. You got to guess, is it AI or is it not AI? I do want to play you these two little snippets from Hedra where you can take an image. In this case, I found an image of a Muppet-like character, and just I wrote out the text for what I wanted it to say, and I chose from some vo different voices they had, and I made this. We are this. all puppets on the stage of life, but it's our choices that define the performance. So these are really short. And here's another one where I found an image and added some text to it and then used Hedra to generate. We have to find a way to communicate with them. I'll record their sounds and transmit them back to the ship for analysis. I use ChatGPT to get ideas for what she should say, you know, like, so you can try your hand at that because when you know how these things work, you'll be really literate when it comes to like recognizing AI generated content. <clears throat> and of course, we have readings in week four, a bunch of views from artists and designers, readings about the copyright issues, transparency and labeling, and more from artists with disabilities. Now in week five, we talk about how to stay current and avoid the hype, and we have videos about that. 
there is a long history of media scares about new technology. And this article from Slate from way back in 2010 is a really good one called Don't Touch That Dial. And it has a lot of history about all the scares going back to the printing press, Facebook, and more. So for example, this is the 1965 cover of Time Magazine where people were really worried about mainframe computers. You can see here it eating the punch cards and this poor woman holding all the punch cards above her head while the businessmen read the long printouts and so on. And Pessimist Archive is a good site to follow to find examples of media scares in history. And these headlines are from the 1980s and 90s about people worried about robots taking over their jobs because of automation. So it's good to have that context. We'll look at some stories that AI about AI that got it wrong or were misleading. And part of this is because lack of technical understanding leads to untrue stories in the media. So did you see these headlines from back in July of 23, where they said AI was used to create a new and final Beatles song? And everyone was freaking out about it. Like this person on Twitter said, why is Paul McCartney turning John Lennon into an AI model for an unreleased song based on demo tapes? Are you okay with this? Did you reach out? And Sean Lennon politely replied, it wasn't actually happening. All we did was clean the noise from the vocal track. It's been possible for years, but AI just does it more precisely. So people are completely misunderstanding what occurred. Then of course, Paul had to get on and clarify that in this article in Variety. The song was now and then um, which just won a Grammy, by the way. And so you might see headlines now about AI song wins Grammy. So, but that's the real story. They just cleaned the noise from the track. Also, sometimes there's a flawed research paper that leads to many news headlines like this one. This came out in 23 called More Human Than Human, Measuring ChatGPT Political Bias in the journal Public Choice. And it basically said that, you know, ChatGPT has a liberal bias. So all these news articles came out like this one from Forbes and this one from Washington Post. But it turns out there's a very good critique of the flaws in this paper from a newsletter that I read called AI Snake Oil from a professor and PhD student of computer science at Princeton. They also have a new book out, which is really good. And the problems with the paper were that the authors of the paper used an older model. It wasn't even ChatGPT, and they didn't know anything about prompting. They didn't prompt it well. So that's why they got flawed results. And this happens a lot. Like one paper will come out, it's flawed, all the media talk about it. So another thing that happens is experts are often bad at predicting the future. There's a really interesting article in the 2019 Atlantic Monthly called The Peculiar Blindness of Experts. And it's about a story done by this researcher named Tatlock, and he decided to put these sort of expert predictions to the test. And it was in the middle of the Cold War, and he collected forecasts from 285 highly educated experts that together had more than 12 years of experience in their various specialties. And he gave, they had to give specific probabilities of future events. And he had to collect enough predictions so it would separate just a lucky or unlucky streak. So this project lasted 20 years, and they had over 82,000 probability estimates about the future. And what did they find? It turns out the experts were really bad at forecasting. Their areas of specialty, their years of experience, none of that made any difference. They were bad at short-term forecasting and bad at long-term forecasting. They were bad at forecasting in every domain. And I believe this is still happening. Here's an example from 1999 in Forbes where they said a lump of coal is burned every time a book is ordered online. And that turned out to be wrong. And of course, the authors of that were widely cited in the years right after that. And people were saying half of the electric grid will be powering the digital internet economy within the next decade. That was 1999. Turns out that was wrong. There were errors both in the facts and the methodology. And this is a very good article kind of taking that apart and analyzing it. Also, there were a ton of uh, predictions about Netflix and other streaming media like from 2019 saying, you know, chill your Netflix habit. It's it, your binge watching of Netflix and porn is contributing to millions of tons of emission. And, you know, this one from the Guardian too. But it turns out that that was all from this one thing that was a misconception. In reality, streaming video emissions were overestimated by a factor of 80. So there's a really good article from Carbon Trust now about updated calculations now that they know. Um, that this was very much wrong. And it's, so it's really minimal, like streaming media watching, you know, as far as harm to the environment. So I say, let's beware of predictions about AI. There's a lot of them now. 
And this article from Rodney Brooks, who's the former director of the Computer Science and AI Lab at MIT, even back in 2017, was talking about the seven deadly sins of AI predictions. And just to think about data centers now, this article about the projected growth in electricity demand by sector, you can see here where data centers fits in compared to many other technologies. And it sort of puts this data boom into context. So even if it doubles or triples, it's still much smaller than other things that are having a bigger impact on carbon footprint. And by the way, the term carbon footprint as applied to individual actions was put out by British Petroleum a long time ago to kind of take the blame away from fossil fuel companies and put it more on individuals. So we need to think about systemic change more, I think. <clears throat> We also talk about how to stay current, cast a wide net, don't only follow people like you, look at publications from different types of librarianship, look outside librarianship, and look worldwide, not only in your own country. And follow all different kinds of people, like educators, researchers, academics, power users, ethics experts, machine learning experts, business analysts, artists and filmmakers, and architects and designers. And follow many different types of sources like all of these. And in the course, I will give you lots of specific sources that are recommended to follow. Also, if you're interested right now, you can stay current with my newsletter, which is free and it comes out about once a month called Generative AI News. You can find it on my website, NicoleHennig.com. And when you sign up, you get a free copy of my document called 10 Tips for Keeping Up with Gen AI. So of course, we'll have hands-on activities in week five. There's one where we learn to avoid hype in news stories using a special prompt in Claude. There's another one where we analyze an article called Debugging Tech Journalism, and we look also at the field of solutions journalism, how that might help us. And I have built a custom bot called the Hype Detector that you can try during the course. It's built on the Poe AI, where you can just paste in a link to an article and it detects hype and misleading language. And of course, we have readings about all of these things, including future developments and Gen AI and libraries. And then week six will be just about healthcare and medicine. Of course, I'm sure you've heard of all these different use cases like medical imaging, drug discovery, personalized medicine, clinical trial optimization, streamlined healthcare operations, you know, like helping take better notes, virtual assistants and chatbots, restoration of lost capabilities like we saw with the voice, and medical training and simulations for medical students. So there's, of course, a lot of risks too, like biases, data privacy, how do we comply with all the regulations, how to integrate it with existing healthcare systems, and of course, the accuracy concerns. So we'll talk about all of that in the last week of the course. And we'll, we'll generate some ideas for health science libraries. And of course, we'll have hands-on activities and readings for that too. So now I'd like to open it up for questions and discussion. And here again is the link to the slides. And this link is for our materials from the University of Arizona libraries. I'm gonna paste that into the chat also. Um, if, feel free to use any of those lib guides or tutorials. So questions. Yes, let me, I'm gonna do, I see a couple comments first I'll get to. Um, Liz said, I use the Google Translate app on my iPhone for chatting with patients in other languages in the library, not medical. So she just cool. wanted to share that. That's neat. Uh, and then Cecilia said, this is when you were showing the 11 labs voice uh, samples. Mm -hmm. Cecilia said, Vocal ID is already doing this work and has a human voice bank they started creating several years ago. And she included the link there. Great. For Thank you for sending that link. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, Amy asks, thank you, Nicole. I'm enjoying all the information you were saying. I'm curious if there will be any live sessions. Um, no, we aren't planning any live sessions because we want people to be able to do the work anytime. Um, but I do do webinars for specific groups from time to time. So if there's some library or some group that wants to talk to me about that, that could be sort of a side project. And Jennifer, hi, Jennifer. From UA, Hi, um, when you upload photos, does it have to be open source photos? Are we talking about AI generated photos? Jennifer, answer. I'm sort of guessing that you are. Um, if you are talking about AI generated photos, the US Copyright Office has stated that 
you can't copyright an AI generated photo. So that means all of them are free to use. That means you can use other people's AI generated photos in addition to your own. It's always good practice though to say that it's AI generated. Is that Okay. what you were asking? Well, that's the, cause you, you talked about it in week three. So you talked about it, you know, uploading a photo. I didn't know it, it had to be a specific kind of photo or if it's something that you take, is it any photo or did it have to be like an open source photo? I see what you're talking about. You're talking about using computer vision to analyze a photo that Yes, you upload. that's the one. Mm -hmm. Okay. That could be any photo. I mean, Okay. because it doesn't go into the training of the model. So you could even take some copyrighted photo and upload it and ask questions about it. It's only in the short term memory of the model while you're working with it. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, thank you. All the questions I see, but why folks are taking a second to think, I just wanted to ask what your favorite AI program or software has been. Oh, for me, it's really, Yeah. really hard to say because I use so many of them, but I like perplexity AI a lot for searching for things on the web because a lot of what I do involves looking up the newest news stories about technology and stuff. That's one of my favorites. I also like Notebook LM from Google where you can like upload a whole bunch of your own documents and ask questions of them. And they have this cool feature called audio overview where it can generate what sounds like a real podcast, but it's AI voices um, to like a man and a woman's voice talking about your articles. So that one's also one of my favorite because it's, it does kind of an amazing job. I encourage you all to try it. Go to notebooklm.google.com and you can even just give it your own resume and it'll talk about you very, you know, excitedly about what a great person you are and all these incredible skills that you have because it's been set up to like find out what's super interesting and the things that you give it and to talk about it in an excited way. So I love Notebook LM. That's fun. Um, we do have another question. This is from Marjorie. This sounds like an awesome course. How and where do we sign up? So we're going to share that with Region 4 folks. So the class is going to be limited, just like this webinar, to Region 4 folks. It's going to be sometime in early February. The class is going to start. So we'll open the class probably in mid Uh, January, once the course shell has been uploaded, and it's going to be a Moodle course. So we'll, we'll make announcements. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. It's just region4 at nnlm.gov if you're curious about the status of it. But like I said, it's going to be early February. It's six weeks, so it'll run until about mid-March. You're welcome. Any other questions? I was just going to mention, we also have a newsletter that we send out weekly about what different classes are now open for registration. So I'll include that in the chat as well if you want to sign up for that. So that way, when it is available, we'll, it'll also be sent out, excuse me, at that newsletter as well. Great. Thank you, Sam. And there there will be, I think we usually tip, we're going to probably limit the course to about 30 students. Um, we haven't settled on a, a exact number just yet. Um, yes, Amy, we're going to have the recording. We're going to um, trans, we're going to update the transcript and the clip for the closed captioning and then upload it to YouTube. So it usually takes about a couple weeks, um, but anyone who registered will get the recording via email once it's ready. You're welcome. And then Sam popped the uh, the uh, the link to sign up if you're interested in the courses as they're released. You can sign up for notification that way. Any other questions? I had one in case while well, folks folks are still thinking. You had mentioned a few, you know, accessibility focused. apps or, or uses of AI, like Be My Eyes, or using the alt text, or even, you know, generating your voice if uh, a patient has lost it. Do you know of any other disability-friendly uses for AI that you can think of off the top of your head? Um, one use that a lot of people like is just using the language models if you have ADHD symptoms to kind of organize your life and your notes. My own husband has that and he finds it invaluable to deal with that. And I've heard that from several other people. And I just saw a notice for a webinar that's happening tomorrow by someone named Lance Cummings. And it's going to be all about ADHD and generative AI because I've I've just heard from a lot of people saying they find it useful for that just for... Being able to ask questions anytime and not feel like you're bothering people and 
organize your life and stuff and not get distracted. That's so great. that's another, another use I've heard about. Also, that article by Stephen Aquino, I think I mentioned, um, it is a screenshot on one of the slides. Um, just search for Stephen Aquino, A-Q-U-I-N-O. He's got a really good article in MIT Technology Review about a whole bunch of different uses for people with disabilities of generative AI. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I am not seeing, I'm seeing a bunch of thank yous, thank yous in the chat. Um, Sam just shared the link. If you're interested in getting continuing education credit, there's the link there. If I don't see anything else, um, you're welcome to reach out to Nicole. You're welcome to reach out to Region 4. We're just region4 at nnlm.gov. If you think of questions, we can always forward them on to Nicole if you um, wanted to reach out to us directly instead. And the course will be announced soon. So keep an eye out. Um, and we hope that you are interested in signing up. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our guest speaker, Nicole. This was fabulous. Sure. Sure. Um, we hope you all have a great day. Take Looking care now. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.